So I'm here with Corey from the Ask Project. Corey, again, thanks for coming. It's great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So we were chatting a little bit about your background, and that's always obviously where I want to start. So if you could sort of just introduce yourself in your own words, who are you, what's your background, and how did you get into producing the Ask Project? Okay, so my name is Corey Gilschuster. I'm Canadian. I'm from Ottawa originally. I've lived in Israel for 20-something years, over a 30-something year span. Um, how did I get into this? Uh, I was always interested in the conflict itself, more as an observer. Uh, when uh, During the second intifada, we moved to Canada because we newly adopted a child, and I just thought, I, I can't, I'm Canadian. I can't handle both being poor and being uh, stressed because of conflict. Uh, and when I was there, after um, the detoxing in a sense from from this country because it's it can be a difficult place uh i looked for a program in the psychology of conflict and found conflict studies i didn't know about what conflict resolution uh, was so i started an ma in conflict studies to understand what i had experienced from at least israeli side uh and to try to understand the palestinian arab side i also got involved in an arab jewish dialogue group at the same time um, which was uh, uh, kind of unique because the Arabs actually had the power. The Jews did not. Mm. The Jews were all Ashkenazi, uh, Canadian Jews. None of them had really been to Israel. If they had, they'd been for, you know on some trip for two weeks. They knew nothing. So everything was quoted from Ahar, its article. Mm. Whether it was pro-Israel or anti-Israel, it didn't really matter. And the Arabs knew because they were from Gaza, Egypt, Syria. They actually had a lot of um, on-the-ground experience or personal experience. And so it was very interesting to see those dynamics where the Arabs actually controlled uh, the power in the room because they had uh, much more knowledge than the Jews did, and the Jews just kind of felt guilty. That's mm-hmm. what that's what they did. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was actually uh, very helpful to to understand dynamics of what's going on on the Arab side. And then when you started making the Ask Project, that at first I imagine wasn't you had no vision of what it became today. It was no. just uploading some videos, no, and then it evolved all. from there. Yeah, so the idea was, um, it was actually during the uh, 2011 tent protest in Israel, which is sort of like Occupy protest, Mm -hmm. um, and I was arguing, I I was finishing my thesis for my MA, looking for a job and bored, so I was online. Uh, People were arguing about Israel-Palestine, none of them, of course, Israeli or Palestinian, none, of course. Um, and they all knew everything because they saw video and they saw, you know, they had an Har- Haaretz mm-hmm. article to prove their point. And I remember saying to a Canadian woman, um, no, I think Palestinians, I really wanted to bring Palestinians to this tent protest because I thought it's a good way to see democracy in action or an aspect of democracy. And um, they could learn that, you know, that they can have a voice too, or maybe they'd be inspired. I don't know, this is just this thought I had. And she kept saying, no, 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 Israelis are so racist, they would never accept them, which is hilarious because if across from, I lived on, at the tent process, I lived across the street from it, and there was the tent of 1948, which are Arab Israelis, Palestinians of 1948, who were protesting uh, or rallying around this idea of remembering what was Palestine before 1948. And... She said, uh, what are you going to do? You know, how are you going to prove to me that, you know, these Israelis are really not that racist? Are you going to, you know, do a, uh, like a survey, go around and do a survey? And it flashed in my head that I have a video camera. Why am I not doing this? Because I have these conversations with people all the time. Why not? And uh, it immediately popped in my head of, I should form it around a question. Somebody asks a question, form it around that. Because if not, people just go off on tangents. It'll never end. Um, and just ask, you know, six, eight, ten people their opinion. And so I asked people in this forum, give me a question. Now, these are all experts, I put in quotes, experts on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. None of them had a question. Not one. So I reposted, reposted. Nobody would ever ask me a question. Finally, somebody said something like, Israelis would agree to a one-state solution. I said, great. I'm using it as a question. And so I did that, and I think that was my first video. Wow. And then how has that process evolved to today? So are, you, are people donating and then you're choosing a question based on that? Or you just mm. have a ton of questions and choose what you feel is most? I get a lot of questions. Yeah. No, most people who donate, donate a, a, a tiny amount of money. Um, thank you yeah, to everybody. Sure. But it's, but they're small amounts, $10, $20, $30, that kind of thing, which is great. It helps, mm. actually really does help because I have to pay for a uh, translator. When I go to the Palestinian side, I have to pay for transportation. I have to pay for equipment. Uh, um, so... 
Um, no, I choose the questions based on what at this point, this is 10 years later, but what I find the most interesting, what I, what I, uh, are repeat questions. So if I get from a lot of people, a similar type of question, I'll roll it up into one. So it won't be exactly as asked, but it'll be, I'll try to generalize it into something that all those people kind of want to know. And then if there's, I seem to get more on that, I'll go out and ask a more specific question about that. But yeah, I choose a question based on what I think is important to talk about, including because there's a lot of issues in this conflict that no one seems to ever talk about. Um, I'm very good at talking about the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. I uh, that's I always notice this. Um, and I think the fact that media um, and anyone else involved in this conflict, whether they're, you know, a propagandist or not, I, the, nobody, either they're talking about it or they're, they're, they're not talking about it in a semi-neutral, objective way and just asking interesting, curious questions. Um, so that's what I try to do. And in terms of what are the main elephants in the room, I mean, and the, from the Israeli perspective, I guess it's just the Palestinian issue in general. But for the Palestinians, what would you say the big elephants in the room are? Oh, it's lots of things. There's contradictions in how they view themselves as Muslims uh, who are seeking peace in their in their view, and how Islam is a religion of uh, of justice at, plus uh, fairness and uh, and peace, and at the same time saying it's legitimate to kill Israeli civilians because they're well, of course they stole our land, so justice therefore trumps. And then you go, but yes, but Islam, it says in Islam, it says in the Quran, do not kill women, children, old people. Uh, and they say, yes, of course. And I can see in their eyes, there's kind of going, yeah, there's a bit of a, you know, but no, 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 I have to look good. And, I, you know, I have to uh, follow uh, my Islamic pr principles and uh, and my, my, my core principles as a Palestinian. So I like to talk about all of those contradictions, uh, both on the Israeli side and on the Palestinian side. And do you feel most people are being honest with you, or at least mostly honest, or can you pretty much tell when Don't somebody? Know. Uh, mm. Well, on the Israeli side, I know. I mm. it basically nobody's lying, but there might they might not be as brutally holding back awful bit. as they would be if there wasn't a camera. But they're saying the same thing. They're basically saying the same thing, just not. And sometimes I'll I'll throw in, okay, so what you're saying is this, and they'll go, yeah. Um, because I know the Israeli side much better. The Palestinian side, they are worrying about if they're, how they're going to be perceived by their parents and by their friends and community around them. So it's not about, as, or, or uh, what the authorities will think, whether Israeli or Palestinian. Um, so it's not about, a lot of people I see from comments think that people are, are um, uh, giving an answer that internationally will sound good. Now, nobody's thinking about any of you people at all. They really aren't. They have no idea that what the internationals think. They don't, and they don't care. They just, that's not their, their way of thinking. It's really about um, what will my husband say? What will my father say? It's always about the men, always. Um, what will my uh, peer group say? Will I get in trouble with this? Will I get arrested? That's another thing. Will I get arrested by either the Palestinian Authority or by the Israelis for what I say? Um, these are the dynamics. The Israelis obviously don't care about that. They don't have that issue. Um, they, Although every so often I do get somebody who was in a video who I happen to know, like from the supermarket. I don't know them, know them, but and they'll say, oh, yeah, you got me in trouble because I said, and I'm like, well, you know what? You said what you said. I'm sorry. Like, um, yeah, that happens as well. But yeah. no, nobody's thinking about these things. They're just in front of a camera, so they're acting a bit better, but not really thinking about what will, you know, Americans think of me. Nobody's thinking about that. Well, that's good. And then from, have you, do you know if anyone's gotten in trouble from the Palestinian side? Exactly. Not as far as I know. Okay. I mean, I, in, in trouble in the sense of, Arrested or seriously. no, 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 nothing yeah. like nothing, nothing like that. Uh, not as far as I know. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. And I would actually feel bad even if they even if they said something horrible. I no, I, it depends what they did. Mm -hmm. I guess if they went out and killed somebody, no, I sure. wouldn't feel bad. No, I would not because uh, I don't like violence. And how is your experience going into Palestine for these type of questions? Are you typically welcome? Do they perceive the questions as sort of with some animosity, or are they pretty oh, yeah. interest? Oh, yeah. It, it's a it's a mix. So first of all, they never know what the question is before mm -hmm. on either side. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we kind of hint, like I ask them, "What do you do? What do you study? Um, what is your 
a background in. So maybe I'll try to, if I know their history, like, you know, we've met people who are history students and I'm like, oh, or, a, or someone who's a lawyer. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, I got, I got something connected to law. Because they would just be, because I know out of the eight people I'm going to ask, you know, most people aren't going to know the answer to these things. So, or not going to have a, a, a really strong opinion on it. Um, they don't know the question. When they hear the question, you can see sometimes they're a bit thrown off. And they're like, oh. And I'm like, okay, like, relax. Don't worry. I'm just giving, asking your opinion. Like, um, sometimes you could see the animosity. You see that, you pick that up with both Israelis and Palestinians uh, where they are offended by the question. The most common one on the Israeli side is they make the assumption that I am a left-wing activist, that I am there to, I'm like from breaking the silence. And I am there, they ask me, they go, oh, you're from, and I, 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 are you from breaking the silence? And I'm like, no, 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 just have a, a this YouTube channel. They don't believe me. They really think I'm trying to trick them and that I'm going to edit them. And you can hear it in the video. They'll say, sorry, I'm going on a tangent about Israelis. No, no, no. They'll hear it in the video of them saying, now keep this, keep this. And I'm like, yeah, it's all there. Nothing mm. is cut out. I don't cut anything out. Uh, unless somebody said, look, you got to cut it because I'm going to get in trouble. And then I'm like, fine. Um, so on the Palestinian side, uh, nobody's ever asked me, no, nobody's ever said anything like that. They uh, will sometimes contact me later saying, take me out. I thought about it and my father would kill me if he Mm. knew I was, uh, you know, in something like this, talking about Israelis because it's, you know, family shame or, or, you know, giving, uh, it's very public and nothing is allowed public in Palestine. Um, But in terms of, wait, I was going to go on another, uh, no, forgot, doesn't matter. Go ahead. Uh, Are there any key memorable moments on either side, things that really stood out over the 10 plus years of you doing this, of somebody who gave you an answer that just shocked you one way or the other? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's lots. You want a negative? I'll give you a good one, actually, because, you know, like a a positive one. (laughs) That's what I mean. Um, Yeah, I was just telling someone this before. So people often ask me, have you ever seen violence? I've seen two fist fights in between with Palestinians, like people trying to beat the crap out of each other, just because I don't know why. I don't even know the reason. I've never seen any um, conflict violence ever, really, um, in this living here. Uh, except one other time when there was a protest and I happened to be there. Um, what I did see was the what really is happens day to day in the 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 conflict and um, in the occupation. In that sense, uh, I was in a taxi, um, a Palestinian taxi, and I was going to a Jewish settlement to take a bus. And I figured, oh, I'm already in the taxi. Let's ask uh, the Palestinian guy who seems to know English. He's an older man, in his 60s. I'm going to ask him a question. So the question was, don't know this guy. No idea, just spoke, speaks English. And I say, have you ever experienced kindness from Israeli? And he tells me a story about how during, I think it was the first Intifada, or the second Intifada, I can't remember. It must have been the second Intifada. Um, when his business uh, of a kiosk, um, like selling you know chocolates and gum and things like that, um, started to go broke because, nobody was going out. Everyone was under lockdown because of the intifada. Um, All these things were happening. And he said he got all of his uh, um, goods from uh, some guy in Tel Aviv. And he said, I owe you, I think he said 30,000 shekels. I think I can't pay you. And the guy said, pay me if you ever can. And I said, wow, did you, were you ever able to pay him? And he said, no, I was never able to, able to pay him. I closed the store, went bankrupt or whatever. Mm-hmm. There is no bankruptcy in that sense. Um, and started driving a cab. And he's telling me this on video. And a Palestinian saying that he experienced kindness from a Jew is Pretty rare. very taboo. First of all, rare because they, they're, you know, Palestinians are rarely actually in contact with Jews. But to admit that publicly, wow, really nice. Okay, so I get out of, he stops in front of Ariel, and I get out in the roundabout, and as I'm getting out of the cab, a soldier, 20-year-old soldier, kicks his car. And I just, I lost it because I have a temper. And I start screaming in Hebrew, what the fuck are you Mm -hmm. doing? What are you doing? And he's like, you're not allowed to park, he's screaming in Hebrew at him, you're not allowed to park here, you're not allowed to stop here, you're not, I'm like, why did you kick the car? And he started getting in my face, the soldier, of, you know, who are you? Get out of here. This is none of your business. This has nothing to do with you. And I kept thinking, okay, my temper is going to get this Palestinian guy in trouble. There's no point. This is silly. So I got out and and so what, his commander had to come over and kind of break us up because we were screaming at each mm-hmm. other. Um, and that, 
uh, is is sort of uh, a metaphor of everything that's going on. This guy was telling me, went, took a risk in a sense of telling me a story about how Jews, Israelis were were um, compassionate towards him and showed him some kindness, and some twenty year old Israeli guy who thought he shouldn't be a soldier thought he shouldn't be stopping there and has control. So meaning. You might get a cop in Tel Aviv doing something similar, but he would never kick a car. He might scream at you. That's common. Calm, I get mm-hmm. screamed at all the time. But no one would kick your car because that's just going too far. Whereas he could do that with an older Palestinian man because, you know, there's no one really to check up on you. There's no one really to complain. So that's one experience. And that happened about eight years ago. Um, so that's one experience that uh, stands out. The shame is that the positive side of that story, I'm sure would happen all much, much more frequently if they just had the chance to have more exposure to one another. You know, I mean, there's a set, as you said, there's very, very little communication between Israelis mm-hmm. and Palestinians. And even the pe- the Palestinians who come in on work visas or they're not really interacting with Israelis. No, not at yeah. all. Not at all. I see them on my bus every morning. Yeah. Um, they're in the buildings because they live in the buildings that they're constructing, but they barely speak Hebrew and they very, you know, they, and they have no very little interest in interacting with Israelis. Um, mm. It's not really yeah. that they're looking for it. But yeah, there's it's it's two different worlds completely. So do you hope mostly foreigners or Israelis and Palestinians are consuming your content because I guess both groups could benefit enormously from hearing the, the answer. I wish questions. it was Israelis and Palestinians. Actually, the original intent was to have a dialogue between Israelis mm-hmm. and Palestinians because they can't meet. Mm-hmm. But I realized that neither side cares to meet. They don't care. I get Israelis who recognize me. I almost never get Palestinians who recognize me. I Because of asking the questions, I kind of hope nobody recognizes me because... Uh, th- I, I, I think it's fresher. It's it's more real if they have no clue what I'm doing or if they make an assumption. I, I'm sure I'm a leftist. You know, they think I'm a leftist propagandist. Great. What? So tell me, what do you think? Tell me why. Mm-hmm. Um, but I part of me wishes that they would actually uh, interact. They would actually get to know each other. Um, but yeah, I don't see that happening. Mm-hmm. And how do you, if if you had to evaluate your own biases, how do you feel you stand on the conflict? Are you do you feel it's you're pretty in the middle? Because that's what it no, seems. Not, no, not so much. No, no, I have my definite sure. opinions. And no need to share them, of course. Uh, no, I don't mind. I, I have definite opinions, but I'm always uh, faced with a contradiction to whatever I think. Mm. Always, and as we should be. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so I, you know, I think a one state solution will never work. And then every so often I meet somebody who like, oh, that could work. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's the one person who, yeah, maybe that could work. But it's uh, pretty rare. So, mm-hmm. How has the, the project just changed your opinion about the conflict over? Because I imagine from the beginning to now, there's been some big shifts in your perspective. Or well, maybe not. it happened very quickly. Um, I, I, and it hasn't changed since then. So mm-hmm. two things. First of all, I, I, my joke, or it's true, is that the right wing in Israel is more correct about the conflict than the left wing, by far. They have much better analysis. Now, it's based on their own, uh, uh, what how they see Palestinians, but they just happen to be much more correct. Meaning, security is an issue. Security is a big issue. A lot of Palestinians really just want to get rid of the Jews. Mm-hmm. Like they have no, yeah, that's, and the left wing thinking, no, no, no. Once we have some, um, some settlement in, 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 in place, it'll all be fine. I don't know. I hope, I wish, cause I'm still, I am that kind of left wing like, Oh, but we should all get along. I'm very Canadian that sense. Um, but I think the right wing is more correct. Um, and Palestinians, the um, I didn't know anything about what they thought, and I realized they do not care about us or or know Israelis in any way or Jews at all. Don't care. They have a lot of mythology about Jews. Uh, it's based on what they hear in the media and actual um, knowing them in some way, but a lot of it is 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 fantasy and and in what they think, and I don't see that changing in any way. So. I was a bit surprised by that because yeah. I thought, well, you live next to each other. How do you not know each other? But you, you, you quickly learn that people don't, they don't want to know each other. They're, it's easier to, th- to think in your own narrative because it strengthens your own sense of who you are. It just, it's just easier. So yeah. yeah and that was, I, I should have known having studied conflict studies. I should have known that. No, I feel like Israel is completely full of surprises. The, the main thing to me before I came here, knowing very little 
is I definitely oversimplified the entire conflict, no matter how much I tried to learn about oh, yeah. it sort of in advance. But when you get here and you spend any significant amount of time, you realize there are no words to express the complexity of the issue in every respect. It is truly, it's no surprise that this is one of the, the, the stalemate of stalemates, the yep. never-ending conflict that yep. still doesn't seem like it's anywhere close to being Yes. Ends. Yes, and and I don't see, there's nothing on the horizon. There's no leader with any vision. I can't even imagine what the vision would be. And I know everyone who's listening to this is going, no, 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 it's really simple. Two states, or no, 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 a binational state, or no, no, no. And I, all of those have huge issues which would quickly devolve into civil wars, easily. Yeah. E whether it's two countries, one country, doesn't matter. Um, because most of the people will disagree with whatever the person who's thinking this thinks. Yeah. So I don't know what to do about that. Yeah, it is interesting. A lot of these people think a statement like that is sort of politically motivated, and it's really not. No, it's no matter where you stand, what you said is true. It's yeah. irrespective of, yeah. of the political bias. Yeah. 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 Ooh, so and you can't change human beings. Human beings are human beings. They think in these tribal ways. Yeah. So. And I, I have ideas of how you can manipulate and change that to a certain extent, but nobody's going to use them. You know, nobody's going to use marketing. You use, you know, you, 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 you talk about the positive sides of peace. But is that really going to work? No, because we're, we basically, in the end, when I hear Palestinians say, no, we want to we want to expel all Jews, we want to kill the Jews, I'm like, well, you know what? My grandparents were, light. were right. They, everyone hates the Jews. Yeah. So it just feeds into what we already think. Sure. And, and do you think something like the Abraham Accords are a meaningful step forward, or is that yeah, just— Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I, everything positive is positive. Sure. I don't—actually, um, I, I give Netanyahu, um, who I cannot stand, I give him— uh, a lot of respect for 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 manipulating this whole situation towards having peaceful relations with the Gulf countries, with uh, Morocco. Um, it's better than war. Uh, this the if you speak to Egyptians today um, about Israel, Israel is Satan to to most Egyptians. I was there thirty years ago, and they would say it's Israel is a what do they call it, a lion or a tiger that wants to pounce and kill you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Nobody wants Egypt here. Um, but it's better to have an agreement that doesn't create a war than than the than having a war. Obviously, mm -hmm. I wish that with Palestinians as well. It just we're so intertwined that it's just it's much more difficult. So I don't see how we could do that exactly. Have you ever gone around to neighboring countries? I mean, you said you were in Egypt 30 years ago, but did you ever do any recording anytime time In recently? Jordan a little bit. Jordan, no, yeah. not recently. Yeah. It was That was at the very beginning. Yeah. And it was more of, I was doing it kind of stealth. Like I had my little tiny camera in my hand. You could barely see it's a camera. Uh, and it was more because there was all these anti-Jewish books, anti-Semitic books on every street corner. Which, And the reason I did that is because in the Arab-Jewish uh, uh, dialogue group I was involved in in Canada, there was a woman from Egypt who was telling me, no, there's no anti anti-Semitism. No, no, no. There's no, I grew up in Egypt. We don't hate Jews. And I was in Egypt and on every street corner, there was a book showing tentacles and a Jewish star and everything was about obsessed with the Jews and how evil they are. And I was like, you're either lying to me or she's lying. Um, and I saw it, of course, in Jordan. I see it in Ramallah. I see it not as much in Ramallah, actually, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. um, so that was why. Uh, but uh, I would be worried about getting being arrested in most almost all Arab countries because of this. Even Jordan, you would say? Oh yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be doing anything about the about the monarchy. So I guess that I'd be safe from that. Mm. But still, you know, going to ask Palestinians questions. I don't know. I, there's people are very paranoid. They will very quickly turn you into the authorities. Um, so for some reason, uh, Palestinians in the West Bank and Israel, it's not as big an issue, but I've heard stories in Jordan. I don't know. I would, I want to try. I, I would yeah. love to try, but I would be very afraid. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, in terms of, you said you already spoke on the one state solution. Do you have any hope for a two state solution or is that also something just, any, I, I mean, theoretically anything's possible. I still say the best uh, of all bad solutions is the two-state solution because everyone's been talking about it for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. They kind of know what to expect, more or less. We kind of know if there's going to be borders, where the borders will be. Um, I, I, so it's the, it's, it's the one solution that I say has maybe a chance, but I don't see it. No one's working towards it. Nobody wants it. And the current political governmental upheaval that's going on in Israel at the moment, how do you think that's going to manifest in terms of impact on the 
conflict. No, don't, oh no, no, no. I don't. Uh, no, I can't think of any any connection. Somebody just asked me this mm. about what's going on with the protests in Israel is connected to what's going on with um, the Israeli army um, uh, targeting uh, um, what we would call terrorists in the West Bank. There's kind of no connection. They think there are people protesting here against that. I'm like, no, 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 no. They, most Israelis agree with uh, eliminating terrorists mm-hmm. people, because most of these people have actually either a- have actually killed Israelis or are planning to kill Israelis. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard to find anybody, right or left, who would say, no, we really shouldn't be doing it. They sure. would say, come on. But in terms of somebody like Ben Gavir having more power and then the yeah. settlements expanding or uh, that type of thing manifesting uh, into— yeah. I don't know. I don't like I don't like giving predictions because every time I've heard a prediction from anybody and these are political scientists, they're always wrong. Yeah. It always went in a it's different true. direction, sometimes worse, sometimes better, but always wrong. Um so I don't know, but it can't help. So the fact that Ben Gvir and Smotrich are a part of the government does embolden a lot of people who vote for them. And so there are going to be um settlers, uh Jewish settlers in the West Bank, most of who are quite moderate surprised me. It's that kind of surprise. That's another thing that surprised me. Because mm-hmm. I expected them to all be Smotriches and, and mm-hmm. Ben Gvirs. And actually, most of them are not. Um, they might vote for them, but they are not, they're not uh, people who actively want violence. Whereas Ben Gvir and Smotrich are, are sort of um, these symbols of, we're not going to take crap from the Arabs. We're going to show them who's boss. And so, P, I think people vote for them because of that. Because they love this idea of we control and they cannot. They cannot you know, forces into this. Um, so then you're going to get those fringe people who are, and I've met them, they exist, um, who might feel that it's okay to use violence more. So yes, that could uh, escalate things even more. So, And then again, I'll, this is sort of along the lines of a predictive question, but in terms of the shift towards the broader Arab community and Israelis getting along, it's essentially just to combat Iran, that is often seen as something potentially very positive just because it's, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That could cause some meaningful peace in the region and then a defeat of Iran that produces some lasting peace. Same stance, just not sure. I, I don't know I mean, because course, yes. because if you're if if it's the leaders, it's basically the leaders making peace, which is better than nothing. I yep. don't want to, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But if the people all still hate each but other, but the people then... all are all, I mean, the people in the Arab countries in Saudi Arabia, most of them can't say all, mm-hmm. most of them um, are still anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian because they 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 see Israel as this foreign entity. It's uh, it, it's going to take a lot for. Uh, to convince people in the Middle East because they've been sold this idea of uh, the Jews invaded and they're colonizers. And these are not the same Jews that came from the Bible. These are not the Jews in the Quran. These are different Jews. These mm-hmm. are Zionists, mm-hmm. completely different. I mean, it's the same thing, the same people. Um, again, I still think it's better than active war or even a cold war. And I know for a fact, because I do check who watches my videos, the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia included, included, I have a lot of followers of Israelis. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Palestinians, I do not. So... Um, that's, yes, it that's sort of interesting. makes sense. They're a little more connected to the to the Western world, I suppose, in the Gulf states than maybe. Maybe, maybe that's why. I don't. Yeah. I don't know what the reason is because you would think Palestinians would want to know at least what Palestinians think, yeah. or and Israelis think, but they don't seem to care. Whereas I get more because uh, I did the 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 math. How many viewers I have? You know, over six months from Saudi Arabia and from the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, uh, divided by the population. And there are many more in the Gulf countries than, than Palestinians. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, another quick produ- production question I wanted to ask. So when you choose a question or set of questions, one of the things that I think people who have not spent time here may not appreciate is the importance of going around to sort of a representative demographic throughout mm-hmm. Israel. Because if you ask, pick any given question, you come to Tel Aviv and you leave it at Tel Aviv, you sort of know what you're going to get for the mm-hmm. most part. And same thing is for truth. Yes and no. I actually, I found it's not more quite, it's, it's actually more diverse than I okay. expected either. Because in Tel Aviv, I get a lot a lot of right-wing answers. Mm. Um, you have more of a chance of sure. getting a left-wing answer. But, and in Rehovot, I met people who believe in a one-state solution. Did not expect that. Really? Yeah, I did not. But, I mean, I, I'm kind of, you know, it's self-selecting here because I, mm-hmm. I happen to remember it because it surprised me. Um I noticed more of a difference between the coast and the mountains. So in Jerusalem, 
I get kind of like the much more extreme answers yeah. than I do mm-hmm. anywhere between Ashkelon and, you know, and Naharia, um, with the Jews. Um, so yeah, it really depends, but I do try, I really try to go to, uh, to as many diverse places as possible. Mm-hmm. And do you do multiple questions at the same time? Or because oh, yeah. it seems like a lot to go around one question at a yeah, time. Yeah. And Where's I my bag? I have, I'll show you after. Yeah. I have a list of probably 30 running questions at all times. And I only ask one or two in each location. Mm-hmm. If I ask, I mean, because they're 30 questions. Yeah. So usually if I go out for a full day, I only get 30 actual videos. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it kind of depends what the questions are for religious, for secular, for, it depends what it is. Um, but yeah, I don't ask in the same place at all. Also, because at the very beginning, you know, people would pick on on the videos and go, "Oh, you asked someone in Tel Aviv. Of course, you live in your little bubble." And I'm like, "Actually, it's not quite a bubble because if you ask the guy who works in the hardware store, or the uh, and I'm thinking of the guy who fixed my bike, he was very right wing. He voted Smotrich years mm. ago, um, and this is in the middle of Tel Aviv. Um, so, but I still, just so people will not criticize, I really try to get as many places and as many types of people as possible. I actually um, actively stalk women because women tend to not um, uh, answer as mu- as often mm. because they don't like the way their hair looks. I criticize women for this. It's, uh, women have to stop this and and give political opinions more often. Uh, uh, Ethiopians, black people. Um, more often um, because they and Arab Israelis because uh, Ethiopians and Arab Israelis are the two groups that are the most or the least likely to actually to answer a question on camera. Palestinians, not a problem. Uh, uh, Israelis who are not Ethiopian and not Arab, not a problem. Those are the two. So I spend more time, if anything, trying to get them. That's interesting. Why in the case of the Ethiopians do you Seems. Cultural. You don't, I had, my neighbor was Ethiopian. I actually, I haven't posted this yet, but I said, what is it? And they said, it's a cultural thing. You do not talk publicly about these things. Mm-hmm. Do not. It's very, you know, your, your, your community, your Ethiopian community is going to criticize you. And that's, that's big. So I get people who you can kind of read who are Ethiopian and they're like third generation, second generation, who are less influenced by it. And there are some people who are very influenced by their community. So it kind of depends, but I try. Mm-hmm. The, the different minority groups of Israel are a whole nother interesting facet mm-hmm. to the country and yep. something that I think, again, if you haven't been here, you definitely have no idea about. Yep. And what, probably the best example is the Druze, mm-hmm. who I just find they're just fascinating, wonderful people. Mm-hmm. All of my exposure to the Druze have been awesome. And you, you have plenty of videos speaking to the Jews. Right? Yeah, they were also a hard one. Um, they weren't quite as hard as They're Arab Israelis. They're secretive people, though. They're a little bit like, ooh, you know, what is my family going to say? And I would try to go, no, no, you're, you're, you're representing. You're representing your people. And sometimes if I put it that way, you know, to try to convince them, they don't know, still don't know what the questions are. But they um, might also think you're fishing for religious answers, right? Because they keep all that quite close to their chest. They do. Yes. Could be. I don't. I haven't really specifically asked them. Although, no, I don't think I've asked them any religious uh, specific questions. And how do you peg them, sort of relative to Palestinians, Israelis? Where do they? Because they're sort of more a neutral party for for the conflict and everything else, right? I mean, they got sort of divided mm. in the north, and they all fell across the three different borders. And it seems like they're all pretty comfortable where they are, like especially yeah. in Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of like how often, like their stance on the because con- they don't necessarily align. Because, for example, a lot of Arab mm. people within Israel aren't serving in the military, but yep. Jews typically do. Yes. So they're sort of a better integrated group or they're more interested in Israel as a state than the <laughs> average Palestinian. So from my perception, and this is totally mm. my perception, is they feel that they are judged as equally uh, by the Jewish Israelis as an Arab Israeli would be. So they kind of sympathize with Palestinians to a certain extent. At the same time, they also feel this need that they have to serve in the army. So there's a bit of, there's a little bit of a, and they are the ones who actually in the army are more likely to be serving in at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, Mm -hmm. Al-Aqsa, because they speak Arabic and they, they, they know a little bit about the Quran. Um, so they can, you know, they can check if somebody's going in is really, there's a whole thing about only Muslims can go into, to pray to, to, um, Haram al-Sharif. Um, so they're usually the ones from what I can tell, uh, there might, might be Muslims or Christians as well, but I, a lot of them are Druze. Um, so my, ex, but my experience asking them questions is they feel they kind of get screwed by the Jews because they're interpreted as being Arabs. Um, 
And I know this also because I had a coworker who was also Druze, and she really thought all the time that everyone was racist to her because she's Arab. And I'm like, no, <laughs> there, there was no, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I missed it, but she would, she would, uh, I think she thought that a lot of things that happened at the university were because of racism. And that is not my experience because I'm again, the spy in the background who's always listening. What are people saying? What are people saying? And they were never saying anything about her or about Arabs. I've never heard anyone say any, they, it just, it doesn't, um, it's not part of what how people think. Mm -hmm. I think she was interpreting it that way. Mm. Um, so that's my experience, really, with Druze is that they, and which is uh, I would look at Jewish Israelis as saying, guys, you really have to get your act together and show more appreciation, active appreciation for for people who are a little bit different, Bedouins and 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 Druze yeah. and uh, Christian uh, Israelis and and Muslim Israelis, saying you're not against them. Or if you have an issue with them, what is that issue? Be more honest, because Israelis love to show how, you know, how direct and honest they are. Um, and But it's interpreted by the Arab different groups as that they're against them. And it's I don't think it's actually true as much as they think. Yeah, no, I've seen th things with that myself. Like I'll be with a friend or my mm -hmm. girlfriend's family or so on, and there will be some encounter one way or the other. And I can tell that what was intended is totally different than how yeah. the person perceived yeah. it. Yeah, and I and I relate to this as a Jew, as a Canadian Jew who has a mother who, as, as I constantly joke, and it's true, comes home from the supermarket going, "Everyone's a Nazi. They mm -hmm. all hate the Jews. Yeah. They hate me." And I'm like, "Why? Why do you think in the supermarket that I, they spoke German?" I'm like, "Well, they just spoke German. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean no. They gave me a look. They could tell I was a Jew." And I'm like, "No, no. They don't know you're a Jew." Yeah, I had a my family the first time I visited Germany. They just couldn't uh, the Jewish side of my family, of mm -hmm. course, couldn't understand why I would want to go. Yeah. You know, and this was five years ago. Yeah. It was yeah, yeah, it wasn't yeah, in yeah, the seventies yeah. or something. So it's uh I, I would I would say that would be one of my biggest criticisms of the Jewish people on the whole is mm -hmm. maybe a hypersensitivity yep. towards anti Semitism. Oh, I yeah. think it's very counterproductive. Like to the paranoid yeah, sense of, exactly. of being now yeah. I have actually encountered actual oh, anti Semitism. It's real. It turns out to yeah. be real. Yeah. So I don't want to say there isn't. I'm just saying sure. yes, we we tend to see it in places that are, that it doesn't exist. And that's what I'm witnessing with Arab Israelis. And some Palestinians, where there are people who are absolutely racist in Israeli society, or subtly racist, is actually much more common. But the the norm is actually not. They are not even perceiving what the Arab thinks there is going on. I guess that's a problem, though. Is it's it is founded in reality. It's not a totally yeah. unjustified oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. paranoia, yeah. but at the same time, the paranoia is unhealthy. Yes, there's not a lot to be done. That's right. To try to mitigate it. That's right. And then also between between Palestinians and. Uh, like Muslim, Arab, Israelis. Do you notice a big distinction in responses in general there? Or? Mm, a, a little bit because I'm doing it in Hebrew also. So mm. it's not quite... Not neutral, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so I do when when I'm in the West Bank and asking Palestinians, and I can I can tell usually the person in front of me is actually I say from my side, like meaning they're Israeli Arabs. Um, I will I have my second list in my in my bag of Arab Israeli questions, so I'll ask there in Arabic, and I don't think I'm getting no, I don't think I'm getting uh, any different answers. It's always like a little bit of a test, you mm -hmm. know, is is would that same person answer me differently in Hebrew or in Arabic? And I actually don't think I'm getting different answers because um they often say I don't want to answer that. And I think they feel that they're between the Jews and their Palestinian brothers and they might get in trouble with either side or both sides or so um I don't know. I mean, mm. I don't know what they really feel. I think they feel like they have a foot in both places, in a sense. And I think they do feel that they, because I've heard them say this um, to me, not, if, the problem is with, I, I noticed with Palestinians, if you ask them a question directly, they don't actually answer honestly, or the way I think of, of as being honest. But if you ask in a very indirect way, or you don't even ask, they'll tell you things. Um, so, for example, I was in Bethlehem once, and this woman who was wearing very low-cut shirt was um, was uh, I thought was Palestinian from Bethlehem, and I thought, wow, maybe she's Christian. You know, I guess they're you know they dress very you know provocatively, you know, like what we would think mm -hmm. of as normal, but you know, for Palestinian society, it's provocative. And then she realized I'm, or the guy said, no, he actually lives in Tel Aviv. She switched to Hebrew, was like saying. 
yeah, these people pointing at the other Palestinians, they're strange. They're not like us. And I was like, us? We're like, mm. we have some, and she turned out to be Muslim from Haifa. And um, she saw probably about, it was a snobbery thing. It was more of a, her looking down on them so she could feel more elite. Um, she felt more, or she was uh, showing me how we're so much more alike than she is alike to them. Would she say that in Arabic? Probably not. I, I but still, mm. I just thought that was interesting. It so. is. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of sort of Uncle Tom type accusations being thrown around within the Arab community for the people who are more interested in integrating and maybe. Making some I don't know. I don't know enough about that, and it would be yeah. super interesting. I know definitely that West Bank Palestinians kind of look at them as like, well, I don't know about sellouts, but they, you know, look how they 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 live in Israel. Look, they have so much. They they have more money than we have. Um, I, I know one of the things they talk about in the West Bank is if they have yellow license plates. So if you see someone with Israeli license plate, not Palestinian license plates in the West Bank, the assumption is that they're not that they're Jews. The assumption is they're Arab Israelis. And you have to be very careful because they have better insurance and they can get you in more trouble. Mm. So you're always very careful around their cars. Mm -hmm. So... One thing that I found interesting on a little bit of a different note is that even when I go abroad, even just home, I still find that wherever I find Israelis, I find Palestinians. Mm -hmm. You know, there's even a little little sort of uh, shopping center near my house where there's an Israeli Jerusalem bakery. Mm -hmm. uh, and next to it is a, a little smoke shop and it's run by Palestinians. Of course. And it's just, it's so classic. <laughs> there's something, by, you know, shoving them apart but keeping them together just the same. It's mm -hmm. pretty bizarre. Yes, we somehow find each other all the time. I was in a, a burger place uh, in Toronto and for, I just arrived in Toronto and I pulled out a 20 shekel bill for some, just by mistake. And the guy looks at me and goes, hi, Israeli. And he was, uh, oh, he was wow. Arab Israeli from Haifa and he worked in a Syrian burger place. Mm, so, that's, that's I'm a, like, I don't know how, how I find you guys, but I find Haifa is do. sort of like as close as that currently exists to a model of, yes. pe of peace yes. between Jews and Arabs. I mean, it's, it's really wonderful compared to most of the rest of the country. It is. I lived in Haifa for a year mm -hmm. and, um, it really is. As soon as you pass Khadera, as you go North, um, people are just more easygoing. Just, I mean, even if you are right wing, even if you are ultra Orthodox, even if you're, you know, a devout Muslim, everyone's just calmer. Which is really nice, um, and much more live and let live. Do you think that's more sort of random, just the people who happen to choose in that area, or do you think no. even maybe a Christian population there sort of uh, cuts the tension? I don't know. I yeah. I don't know if okay. that's it. Um, yeah, I would find that Christians are probably the most moderate. Yes. out of everyone, both privately and publicly. Mm -hmm. I, I also because they're a minority and they feel like they can't you know take a stand too yeah. much on either side. Um, no, there's just uh, it's it's a cultural group dynamic thing. I think where. Most people are so easygoing, so I'll be easygoing as mm -hmm. well. Even if my, you know, if even if my uh, opinions are a little bit different, okay, I'm not going to win this one. Whereas it's easier if you live in a, a place like you know Cologne or Batyam or yeah, yeah. you know Kalanswa. It's easier to to be like, no, these people, I don't like them. Mm -hmm. So over your entire time here, again, conflict aside as well. I mean, just in general. How has Israel changed? Because I can only, I feel like every year, even that I've been here or coming back and forth, it's pretty dramatic. Yeah. So I imagine, yeah, I would say pretty dramatic, even from superficial things to just all the construction and every new building, new shop that pops up to, I don't know, the place always feels like it's evolving much more than I would say in the U.S. Do you feel from the 90s that it's almost like a completely different place or it's more no, or less the same? More or less the same. I think there was a, a for me, it could also be the new person experience. Mm. Because I, I felt that in the 90s. I was here in 89. And then in the 90s with the high-tech boom, uh, late 90s, um, I think things changed because suddenly people had more money. Um, if you went to Tel Aviv in 89, of course there were restaurants, but there were far fewer restaurants. Um, uh, you know, you could name restaurants. I mean, it wasn't that number, but it, was, it was, wasn't that far off. Uh, and now there are restaurants, cafes everywhere, in every small town, everywhere, and good restaurants. Um, I think that changed a little bit, uh, the, 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 the culture in that sense. Oh, and I would say that um, my experience was 
uh, the Mizrahification, if I'm going to mm-hmm. invent a word, mm-hmm. um, the uh, Israel becoming much more Mizrahi. Now, that could have been my experience because I was married to someone who was Yemenite and Kurdish, and and uh, I was only around Mizrahi people. It took me 20-something years to eat Ashkenazi food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember I was at someone's house, and I was like, wait a second, this tastes what like my this? grandmother's yeah. meatballs. Like, how did that happen? Uh, and that was 20 years in. Um, but it did become, at least on television, there was a, a switch uh, in in terms of popular culture of, uh, yeah, everyone, everything became somehow related to Eastern Mizrahi culture very quickly. Maybe light version of it, you know, wasn't quite, you know, um, like being in a Yemenite area, which I was all the time, but it was, uh, uh, it was definitely different than the 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. That was another thing that surprised me when I first got here is I never, because just for context, my mom's side of the family is Ashkenazi, and mm-hmm. my dad's side of the family is just typical Euro-Mutt American, mostly. Don't say just, it's <laughs> just okay. Anglo, Germanic, okay. you know, typical. So I had sort of one foot in the Jewish community, one yep. foot out. So I, did, I, I was missing some information, I guess mm-hmm. I would say. And I had no idea that there was this divide, in some sense, between Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews. Mm-hmm. And where, where are you here, from? Arizona. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, come exactly. On. It's like <laughs> exactly. 12 Jews. No, exactly. I, I, I don't no, know how many there are. You're right. There's definitely not that many. So, yeah, I mean, that's what, it's just, it's strange how many layers, I mean, again, this is beyond the conflict, but just to this place. Yeah, no, and I grew up in Ottawa, I, not a huge Jewish yeah. population, but still 15,000, 20,000, something like that. 95%, 98% are Ashkenazi. So I grew up in a very Ashkenazi, even though my friends, some of them were Egyptian, Yemenite, Moroccan, but because they're not the 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 dominant group, you know nothing about their cultures at all. You know about gefilte fish and you know, um, tzimis, and even they knew about, even if they were, I mean, mo- most of them were half, you know, half Ashkenazi and half um, as far, um, Mizrahi. But I really, did, I didn't even know the word Mizrahi. I just knew that my friend, you know, Gila was Yemenite and, you know, Yael was Moroccan. And you you just know these sort of things. But until I came to Israel and I was like, wait a second, there's all these other Jewish cultures. And because they're the majority of the population here, they control. Um, yes, I, 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 well, speaking to the person outside, Israel was started by European Jews, mostly, not all of them, by the way, but mostly. Um, and so they dominated the culture in a lot of ways uh, in terms of music, food, cultural norms. But it very quickly became a very Mizrahi Sephardic cult country very quickly mm-hmm. and and that's what we're experiencing now politically also because that the right wing is also Mizrahi Sephardic um, seeing seeing the country as as your home and Middle Eastern Jewish Middle Eastern not Muslim not Christian Jewish Middle Eastern mm-hmm. um, and that is interesting in itself that's a whole other topic yeah but, exactly so. the whole demographics shifting in Israel is fascinating mm-hmm. one of the first things I did again when I got here was found as close to the closest uh, thing to an unbiased book I could. I read a few books on the history of Israel mm-hmm. start to finish. And the one that sticks out spoke at length about how at Israel's founding until as much as, I think as late as like the 70s, it was so, so secular that you would sparsely see somebody wearing a kippah. Like mm-hmm. it was, which I find bizarre now. And, and mm-hmm. if you look at where the birth rates are going, and this isn't necessarily at least to say that this is a bad thing, but there's a pretty clear direction the country is going in terms of who the people that make it up are going to be. Yeah. And that seems to be one of the existential threats from many people's perspective. I mean, if you have enough deeply religious people in any... Well, there's still only, I think it's 13% is the statistic I saw, but they're not that much. Uh, Haredi, like Mm ultra-Orthodox, you know, don't don't serve in the army. I mean, some of them do serve in the army, but I'm saying in in general. general. And then I would say the other bigger majority are um, what are called traditional who are may have a kippa, may not. Most of them are Mizrahi, not all, but most. Um, and they tend to see much more, yes, the, that Jewish religious influence is much stronger. They didn't really have, if they, if they did have an enlightenment period, it was more because of coming to Israel and encountering the Ashkenazi secular Jews, going, okay, I get it, but no, my tradition is way more important. Um, and they are they are the dominant majority. Those are the Kud, you know, um, mm. center right uh, religious party supporters. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting because again, I think the average it's it's something like eight nine kids per family within the Haredi community. Haredi, yeah, yeah. Uh, traditional 
it's but not quite, four but or five, four, yeah, three, three four, five, and then Ashkenazi, like you know, two, two. two. Yeah. 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 So again, that paint that's a that has a very it's clear an direction. Yeah. Yes, and I don't think we're all going to be the the fear was years ago demographically that everyone's going to become ultra orthodox. Yeah. There'll be no tax base. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. No. But in terms of at least in the next 30, 40 years, I don't like to make predictions. But similar to what we have now, most more people are traditional, and that's going to have an effect on a lot of. Uh, uh, issues going on here. I don't think there will be secular marriage. Not because the average traditional person who votes Likud is against it. It's just not worth it. It's just not high on the, you know, they would never do a secular um, uh, civil marriage. They're not against people doing it, but they just don't think it's that important, for example. Mm -hmm. Certainly my own bias is I think that Israel's success has been built on secular values. And I do, I am very concerned, mm -hmm. largely at least. I, mean, I am definitely concerned. I don't care which group it is. But if, if, if it becomes too theocratic beyond, well, what it is now, mm -hmm. then I start to think this place. But that's what they want. Yeah. So in their minds, I'm putting myself in the shoes of, of, of the traditional yeah. mm -hmm. person, not the, not the Haredi, not the ultra-Orthodox mm -hmm. person, the a traditional person, the Jewish values, religious Jewish values are better than democra uh, dem democratic values. More important, much more important. And they don't see, that's the issue that's going on now with the protests, is they're not seeing how at some point it could, I don't see it happening, but it could come back to bite them in the ass mm -hmm. at some point. You could have some issue that they don't agree with and they're the minority on and th they get outvoted very easily. And there's no, you know, there won't be a Supreme Court and there won't be, there won't be some other balance to it to say, we can't do that. That's against the minority's rights. Um, and that's what I try to convince those people. And it's very unsuccessful. And it's hard. It's hard for me to even think of uh, an example of, of something that could happen in the next 20, 30 years that would make them care at all. Yeah. And they don't. And whereas we grew up, okay, say you and me, in this idea of living in in a democracy with minority rights of not just because we're the minority, but even if we weren't, it still is a good uh, way of thinking because you never know when it's going to happen to you. You never mm. know when that law is going to somehow come for you. Yeah. And we should always be uh, thoughtful of that. And people here are much more obsessed with this idea, probably because of the conflict and also because of, um, I think, identity identity politics, to give it an over-generalized mm -hmm. uh, idea, but uh, this idea that the, the traditional uh, person here rules, and we are going to tell people what to think, yeah. and it's our turn. I think growing up in North America or probably Western Europe, it's, it's, it leaves you largely unable to fully understand what's going on here. Yeah. Because even, you know, I'll go home. I have a few friends. I have one friend whose dad is Armenian but grew up in Lebanon, mm -hmm. and his mom is from Gaza. Mm -hmm. I have several uh, Iranian friends, and I go over to their houses, and mm -hmm. they know I've been in Israel, and their family is just so excited to hear. Mm -hmm. They're just curious, you know, and everyone gets along. There's no yep. issues. And then you come here or similar places, and it's just hard. It's hard to connect with the, the argument in the first place. It's hard to not understand. Just get over it. Get mm -hmm. along. Figure it out. Peace trumps all of these issues. But yeah, it doesn't. In reality, it definitely doesn't. No, and it's it's it, this is a culture that wants, feels that it, if it won't survive, if that Jewish aspect won't survive, there's a lot of pressure. And I even, I understand it. I mm -hmm. agree with mm -hmm. it. Um, I just don't know how to balance that with, um, with or the democratic values with what they want. Yeah. I, I'm not sure how to do that. Yeah, um, so, You'll yeah. win a Nobel, likely, if you figure yeah. that out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so going back to the ASP project, do you, would you say most of it's entertainment-based, or do you really hope that what you're doing is having a concrete impact? How do you sort of frame it in your own mind? You wake up, you go to make a video. What, what's the ideal outcome of releasing a video? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know about entertainment-based, no. I would say, it's not that I think, uh, there are people who say, oh, you know, Corey is making this to create peace. Uh, no, that's not, I mean, I wish. That would be wonderful, but that's not why I'm doing it. I want people to rethink their assumptions uh, more than anything. I want them to be um, met with information consistently that makes them think, huh, okay, that's not what I thought it was. Because this is like in any place, 
uh, things are much more complicated and complex than people make assumptions. So that's my hope when I go out that I'm gonna. I my my well two hopes for that's the, from the viewer's perspective and the other hope is I'm gonna meet anybody who just gives me a moderate logical argument that's always all my goal is um, and it, they can convince me of something I don't agree with but so for example just talking about the aspect of the Jewish state every so often someone will make a, a, one of the Jewish state type arguments that I go oh, yeah I see what you mean okay I get it I get that and as a Jew not. No, but even if somebody was Palestinian, um, said, you know, I want this to be a fully Palestinian state because I want to exercise my my identity to 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 show who I am publicly to live that life. I I could get that. I I can relate to that. So mm -hmm. I'm always hoping that someone will be able to explain to me in a way that makes me go, huh? Okay, I can put myself in their shoes. And how often do you get you get moderate answers? Would you say most of the time? Because you made it sound like that's sort of few and far between. I think I get more moderate answers on the Israeli side because I find they're just, they like to think they're moderate. They are not as much as they think they are, but they they like to think that way. So they present it that way. So that's where I know how to challenge them. So I'll go, yeah, yeah, but what if? Mm -hmm. So for example, one of the, the, the main things is um, they'll say, you know, Arab Israelis or Palestinians, if they're living, we're, let's pretend we're all living in the same citizenship um, will they have full rights? And they always say, all, almost always, will say, yes, yes, yes. And I say, well, do they have the right to be prime minister? No, 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 no. Or they look at me, ha, huh, I never thought of that. I'm like, well, you got to think about that because that's what, you know, full rights means. Um, could could they do, can I do the same thing as this person? Um, so on the Israeli side, they like to think that they're really moderate. On the Palestinian side, they're much more uh, influenced by these, you know, conflict-type um, uh, slogans. And so I don't even know if they're thinking, you know, about what does it mean. So I try to ask, you know, like, okay, so what does it mean? Let's dig deeper. And sometimes they don't have any deeper because they don't really know. They're just repeating something they've heard, and sometimes they do. Mm -hmm. So if anyone, yeah, if anyone can explain it, I'm just happy they can explain it because I think most people don't think about these things very often, which is a shame. Um, that, that kind of, uh, if anything, upsets me. You live in a situation where you don't even know how to explain it very well. Well, I think you're one of the few people who's actually going out and speaking with Israelis and yeah, Palestinians. Yeah, I it's, think I'm the only one. It, that's what's crazy is I sort of I yeah. had that thought a few nights ago and I looked around and was like, wow, there's actually very little dialogue being yeah. facilitated. It's yeah. crazy. I know somebody said that to me too and I'm like, come on, I can't be the only one. That's ridiculous because it's so easy. You're one of the only I'm people, the, I, yeah, at least consistently. No, consistently, scale, exactly. Yeah. So a few people have done this in little bits mm -hmm. um, and I see on the news sometimes, but it's always just one person kind of thing. I think that highlights the problem, you know, yeah. like that, that yeah. screams the issue. Yeah. And so you, you're after this, you may see a student who you bring along for some questions for a video, right? Uh, no, that's uh, just meeting a student oh, uh, who I haven't seen in a couple of years. So because no. I know you invite at the end of your videos, you often say, you know, yeah. feel free to come by and join me. Do you have people doing that a lot? Not a lot, but every so often, mm -hmm. yeah, if it fits into my schedule. People think I do this full-time. I do not. Yeah. <laughs> I do not make money mm -hmm. on this enough. I wish I could leave my day job. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I have a job from Sunday to Thursday, full-time. I have to work to pay rent. Um, but yes, on when it fits in Fridays and Saturdays, on holidays, and if I can take off a day you know, here and there, then yes, absolutely. I bring people all the time. Yeah. And do your students watch a lot of the videos and is it something they bring up with you a lot? I actually keep a weird separation between okay. those things. So I, right. I work, uh, just fill in the, the mm, listener, uh, I work for a master's in conflict resolution uh, and mediation at Tel Aviv University. So I am the director of the program, so I do a lot of the management of the program itself. Um, I actually do not talk, for the first few years, I didn't even tell people this is what I did and they would figure it out. Because I just thought... If I, because sometimes in, I'm sarcastic in my videos and I'm offending people, I have this sen the weird sense of humor where I have to say offensive things. Uh, it's pointing the elephant out in the room. Um, and so I tried to keep those separate just so I wouldn't get into trouble at work. And then, um, yeah, that didn't happen. So it was fine. Uh, I don't usually take my students until the end of the year when I won't get into any trouble at mm. all. So, yeah, I try to keep those a little bit separate. I imagine the university, though, is, do you really think they would get you in trouble for this type of work? Because it's really in line with well, what you're doing for okay. the university. Well, okay, so you would think. So first of all, there are two levels at every university, right? So there's the academic level, who have no idea of what I do. My boss, who was in his 80s, uh, he's not my current boss, but he's, he's still alive, 
had no concept of what I do, even though he runs the the peace survey um, of Israelis and Palestinians. And I would try to explain to him. He just had no. He'd never watched oh, YouTube. Was with you also going out of your way to try to try to bring it to his attention. At one point, he said something about, and I said, "Yes, I've experienced this." And I tried to explain it to him. He had no idea what I do. I've spoken to a lot of people I work with who are professors, just to improve on, on what I do, asking their opinions. And they'll do me a favor and watch a few of the videos. They have no interest. No interest. And this is what they do. Because they see it as it's not Beneath academic. It's not, ac- yeah. it's not academic. It's not, I'm not asking the question exactly the same way. I'm not asking hundreds of people. Um, I'm, it's not methodologically as sound as they would do. So it just, and if it's not written in a journal, it makes no sense to them. But I'm not trying to do that. That isn't the intention. The intention is to give context. So I ask the question, they say yes or no, and I, then I clarify. Because often the words we use turn out not to mean what we thought they meant. So I could go into that, but that's a whole other thing. Um, and then there's the administrative side. The administrative side has no, they don't care. Not at all. So I'll give you two examples. When I first met one of my administrative bosses, she looked at me and said, you look familiar. Wait a second, are you on YouTube? And I said, yeah, I have a YouTube channel. And she said, why do you hate Israel so much? I said, what do you mean? And she goes, I've I've never watched you, but I've seen the questions you've asked from the titles. You hate Israel. Uh, I said, no, 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 you're, you, you have to watch the videos to understand. I'm asking challenging questions on purpose. But I, it's not out of hate. It's out of curiosity. Doesn't understand it. Another, an, another person who I work with, we had to do a... Uh, uh, we do uh, little trips with with the staff. And I said, oh, can we go to the Temple Mount, uh, Haram al-Sharif, on a, we're, we're tourists. Like, we'll go with the tourists. And they're like, are you crazy? That's insane. No, 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 we are not. That's dangerous. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not dangerous. I've been there multiple times. Anyone can go. No, they won't do it. They have no idea. I go, but it's the core of. And they're like, that. no, we don't care. It's we're not bizarre. doing it. Bizarre. It's yeah. bizarre. You would expect the exact opposite. I mean, even from the administrative yeah. side, it's like, again, you're, you're, this is what you're doing. Yeah, you're going and you're with Israeli soldiers. Nothing's going to happen to you. I would think rather than thinking it's something that's like sort of beneath them, not academic, so on, it would be sort of the indulgent side of their interest because it isn't, they don't have to worry about making it so analytical, quantitative, just in, see the human side of the story, hear the response. Some... No, no, they. I think they think it's too just... sophomoric. Too popular, too sad. I don't know. I, they're really not hard. interested. No, I'm, which is a bit insulting to me, but yeah, <laughs> but it's okay. It's silly. It's, it's okay. silly though. Um, I, I don't know. I never asked, you know, specifically why. So. Sure. Maybe okay. I should. So we're coming up just about an hour, so we can give it a give it a call now, and then go go around and ask some questions. So again, this was awesome. First time, Welcome. second time recording an episode in person. Okay. Um, and first time using the studio. So this has been an awesome experience. And again, thank you so much for okay, coming you can, on. Re- you can report after this how it was. Absolutely. Asking people I'll in the I'll add a little, uh, little, little afterthought. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, folks, very much. Thank you.